So this is 2 Timothy for beginners. This is lesson number two. Title of this lesson, Encouragement and Instructions. And that instruction is remain faithful. And uh, there's, this is rather a long section. I've had to break it up a little bit. So this is part one, 2 Timothy, chapter one, verses six to eight. So just a little review here. So Paul began his letter to Timothy with a greeting and a prayer of thanksgiving where he comments on his fatherly affection for Timothy, who he hopes will soon visit him in prison where he waits for the day of his execution. So there's the setup, that's what's happening when he's writing this letter. He then makes a, a kind of a bridge statement concerning Timothy's faith instilled in him by his mother and his grandmother. And uh, I mentioned last time that Paul uses this device, these bridge statements, okay, to transition from commenting on the faith of Timothy's family to an exhortation about remaining faithful despite the difficulties that they now faith, uh, face because of their faith. And so that gets us to um, uh, chapter one, verse six to, um, verse six to 18. And his first instruction, of course, is you, know, you were faithful, you, you learned your faith from your grandmother and your mother, and I know you have faith, and so his first exhortation is, so therefore remain faithful, stay with that, okay? So in the section we're going to study, Paul's going to encourage Timothy to remain faithful as he has been. He's noted that Timothy, his mother and grandmother were all faithful. In this passage, he's going to list the type of things that Timothy should remain faithful to as a way of living out the faith that is within him. And so he begins, Remain faithful to your calling. Remain faithful to your calling. Timothy was faithful from an early age and highly regarded by the church when Paul first chose him as his helper in the work of the gospel. We read about that in Acts chapter 16. Eventually, Timothy was commended, today we would say ordained if you wish, as an evangelist in his own right and continued to work alongside of Paul. He received the laying on of the hands of the elders of the church to commend him into service. We read about that in 1 Timothy uh, chapter four. At some point, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus in order to continue the work there on his own. So he's not just a helper anymore. He's an evangelist in his own right. He's left behind to do the work in an important congregation. I mean, all congregations are important, but that was a key one because from that congregation, many others were, were planted. So much of 1 Timothy provides teaching that Timothy could use as he organized and administered this particular church, or ministered to, rather, this particular church. So the work of the gospel was challenging, but in previous times, their main worry was the attacks of the Jews. Now, it was the Roman government that was denouncing the Christian religion and about to execute one of its prominent leaders. So now they, they're really facing trouble and persecution. This sent a chill through the churches and especially high profile leaders like apostles and ministers like Timothy and Mark and Titus. Now was not the time to shrink back and keep a low profile, okay? So we read Chapter one, verse six and seven, he says, for this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and, and discipline. So it's not that Timothy had been slacking. I've heard some teachers say that. Oh, he was slacking off. You know, what was he doing? Slacking off, he was watching TV. You know, he wasn't doing his work. It's not that he, he was slacking. And Paul is trying to encourage him you know, to kind of preach again, you know, get off your duff and get out there and work. That, that, that wasn't the spirit of it. Timothy's zeal for ministry was still burning strong and Paul's encouragement here is that he should keep fanning the flames so that the discouragement of the times not diminish his zeal for the gospel because that was the danger. So Paul reminds Timothy of the presence within him at baptism, Timothy received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We know about that, Acts 2.38. 
It was the Spirit of God within him that animated and directed his ministry, and Paul reminds him of what John taught concerning the Spirit of God within man. And I'll jump over to John just for a second. First John 4, uh, verse four, John says, you, speaking to Christians, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, meaning those in the world, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Well, he who is in the world is the evil one, Satan, the one that manipulates and pushes all of the other evil things that happens in the world. So Paul is saying to Timothy, the ones in you stronger than any of the ones in the world uh, you know, opposed, to the, opposed to the gospel. That spirit, Paul says, equips every Christian, including this young evangelist, with three things that enable a believer to face any kind of obstacle or attack. Number one, equips him or her with power. Not just courage or bravery, but the power to hold on the power to endure, the power to suffer, even die, without giving up faith or the hope of heaven. That's the victory. Yeah, you killed my body, but you didn't kill my spirit. Yeah, you, 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 you prevented me from living my life, but you're not preventing me from being with God in heaven. You can't do that to me. The spirit enables us to not be afraid or broken, but to remain faithful, even fruitful, in times of difficulty. Number two, the Spirit provides love. Difficulties and suffering cannot change or destroy the attitude of love in a Christian's heart, constantly renewed and enabled by the Spirit of God. Sometimes when people are suffering difficult moments, difficult times, they think that this gives them the license to be mean-spirited or, or not to extend kindness or love. I'm sick, you know, so I'm, I'm really sick, I'm really suffering, so you know, don't bother me, and I, I have a right to be grouchy and crabby, you know, why? Because I'm sick, or I'm having a hard time, you know, but Paul is saying, no, 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 no. The spirit within us gives us the courage and the ability to get beyond that. Another thing too, discipline. Christians don't lose their minds or their bearing in times of trouble. The spirit of God and his word steady the mind, steadies the heart, steadies the believer in both good and bad times. So Paul is reminding Timothy of the spiritual resources that he has in Christ that will enable him to stay true to his calling as an evangelist, irregardless of the, what's going on in society during his time, whatever persecutions are happening, you just keep doing your job because you have the resources to do your job. Secondly, Remain faithful to your calling, remain faithful to the gospel itself. You know, before they could preach the gospel in the open, but now to do so would become risky. And so we read in verse eight to 12, he says, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. One more verse. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. So the choice was to preach the gospel and risk arrest, possibly death, or to be quiet and avoid trouble. Paul reviews the blessings of the gospel. Number one, he says salvation by grace and not works. Number two, the promise of eternal life. Paul, who has preached this message openly and is now suffering the consequences, nevertheless claims that it was worth it. Since he has the knowledge of God, of the true God, he has guaranteed salvation, he has knowledge that he did the best thing. Of all the things he could have done, he did the best thing. 
He believed that was the better of the two things that he had a choice of as a Jew. To believe that Jesus was the Son of God or not, he chose to believe that was the better thing. He chose to persevere despite the risks and now suffering physically and emotionally for it. But that was the better choice to preach rather than to be quiet and to stay safe. Because now he knows he did the right thing. He did the good thing. He brought news of eternal life to so many other people. And so he's, he's, he's satisfied that he has done what was right and what, was, uh, what he was called upon to do uh, by God. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be satisfied with your life, satisfied with your choices. So Paul doesn't want Timothy to shy away from the message of the gospel, you know, when he says to be ashamed of it. And don't be ashamed of proclaiming it either. Don't be afraid to do that. He wants the young preacher to be ready to suffer on account of the gospel, trusting that God is aware of possible negative circumstances and he can fulfill all of his promises despite these things. You know, we're, <laughs> We like, to, we like to give thanks when God's really taking good care of us, don't we? Man, things are good, the kids are healthy, the kids are happy, things are going good. You know, we've got, got enough resources to take care of what I want to do and even extra if I want to do fun things. Thank you, Lord. You know? But then things go south. The health goes down the drain and I don't know, something blows up, you know, some, some crazy guy on the stock exchange you know, blows up your pension or something. You know what I mean? Things go bad. Where's the happiness then? Where's the thankfulness then? Where's the confidence then? So Paul is saying, when he says, don't be ashamed, you know, don't be ashamed. It's easy not to be ashamed when things are going great, but how about when things are not going so great? Can you not be ashamed then too? Number three, remain faithful to the doctrine. You know, you're calling as a preacher, the gospel itself, you keep preaching that thing, don't let anybody you know, change that message or put you down or stop you from proclaiming. And then to the doctrine, to the teachings concerning Christ. Verse 13, 14, he says, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. So Paul has previously written to Timothy about the problem of false teachers. That was in the first letter, we talked about that. So it's natural for him to make mention of it once again, but this time in a more general way, because he's kind of talked about it specifically in the first letter. Paul not only taught Timothy the gospel, as well as the other teachings of Jesus, he also modeled the way that these things were to be taught. So the standard or the pattern of sound words are the inspired teachings themselves. That's the standard, God's standard, the pattern, the way things are taught, and the conclusions that you arrive as you teach these things. Okay. Faith and love in Christ are the way or the manner that these things were taught and applied and lived out. So you've got the doctrine, the standard of sound words, and what the doctrine produces, faith, love, you know, peace, patience. You know. So Timothy was to maintain and repeat in his ministry the content and manner of teaching and living that he had been taught and modeled by Paul, his teacher and his mentor. Paul was about to be executed and Timothy was to carry on Paul's ministry of preaching, teaching and church establishment after the apostle is gone. So this would require that Timothy guard the essential message of the gospel given to him by Paul so that he could pass it on unchanged to the next generation. Remember, at this time, the gospels were not complete. Today, you know, we, we encourage the next generation, you know, hang on to the book, don't get away from the book, you stay in the book, don't change anything, don't add anything, we got everything we need right here. You know, that, and that's our message to the next generation. But in those days, they didn't have the, well, they had the Old Testament, obviously, but they didn't have all of the New Testament. So it was very important for Timothy, in this case, as a practical matter, you, you do it exactly as I taught you. You teach it exactly as I taught you 
the words, the, the attitude, the conclusions, right? Again, Paul refers to the Holy Spirit as the one who will enable Timothy to maintain the purity of the message and the manner in which it is to be preached. Now, as a normal sinful human being, Timothy could not do this, but through the Holy Spirit, to guide and inspire him, Timothy would be able to keep this charge. That's what Paul is saying here. The Spirit will help you to do this. Just like Jesus told the apostles, you know, that, that, that they'll receive the Spirit and, and He will bring them into remembrance of all things. I think we talked about this a couple of lessons back. You know, I have trouble remembering you know, three weeks ago the title of my sermon, let alone what was in it. I'd have to go back to the notes. So can you imagine three years of teaching by Jesus that you have to remember and teach accurately? You need help. <laughs> so, so Paul is saying to Timothy, you'll need help. And don't worry, you know, the Spirit will help you. To, to keep this very important charge. Um, in the first century, before inspired writings were completed and collected into the New Testament canon, that was done, canon means you know, the, the prescribed number of, not number, but the ones that belong or fit, you know, a measurement. Uh, before the, the, the books of the New Testament were put into the canon, um, AD 397, Council of Carthage uh, is a kind of historical date there. Many in the church had spiritual gifts that enabled them to speak and teach and apply God's word accurately. Today, that's called education. Today, that's called going to school. Today, that's called going to college or being taught or trained to do it. And then you memorize it and you study it and you, do, you write exams and the professors say, yeah, this is, this is correct, but your conclusion doesn't match this passage. You know, that, that's the process of learning. In those days, they didn't have that. I mean, they, they had one teaching others and so on and so forth, but some had the natural ability, God-given spiritual ability to know and to teach accurately God's word. In other words, what ministers and Bible teachers at every level do today based on their education and training in God's word, these same people in the first century carried out these things through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Now, unfortunately, there are some people today who think that that still exists and it doesn't. They begin their, their, their lesson or their prayer with, the Spirit spoke to me and I, I've received a message from the Spirit and the Spirit is saying to the church, yeah, no. Yeah. You know, my response to that, never mind what the Spirit said to you, tell me what this said to you. I, I just want to read along with you where you got the inspiration to say what you've got to say. If you can't give me the chapter and verse, then I'm sorry. I'll listen respectfully, but you're saying the Spirit said to me does not equal inspiration. That equals opinion in, 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 my, in my mind. And I believe what the Bible teaches according to that. These things, as I say, through the agency of the Holy Spirit, again, I'm going to jump out of 2 Timothy, go to 1 Corinthians here, where Paul talks about this very thing. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works in all things in all persons. But to each one is given a manifest, the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So, you know, to minister to the church. The Spirit in those days was giving to different individuals different gifts. He says, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Well, what is that? The ability to apply the word of God, the ability to apply the teachings of Christ in actual situations accurately. And to another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Well, what knowledge? Well, the knowledge from God. So, you know, spiritual knowledge, inspired knowledge. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. So you see the, uh, the different gifts 
that uh, Paul talks about that existed in the first century. Not all the gifts were given to the same person. Some people could speak in tongues. In other words, they could speak in languages that they had never learned. Others had the ability to interpret those languages into a language that everybody knew. Because there are other instructions in 1 Corinthians you know, where Paul is saying, if, if, if one of you is speaking in tongues, but there's no one to interpret, the guy who's speaking in tongues is wasting his time. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. He should sit down and be quiet. Unless there's someone to interpret so that everybody can be edified, there's no use to what, you're, to what you are doing. So there were rules in the way that you use these things in the first century. So to be sure, Timothy had a part to play in both keeping himself pure and following carefully the things he had been taught by Paul, but if he followed the lead and prompting of the Holy Spirit, he, like Paul, would be a faithful minister to the end. The Spirit, in the same way that he gave gifts to these people, would give gifts to Timothy and help him do his work uh, as a minister. Today, all those baptized into Christ receive the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit does influence our lives, especially in regards to our faith. However, in Romans chapter eight, Paul says that the Spirit does the following, and these things remain today. These gifts here, these miraculous gifts, they ceased uh, you know, uh, in the apostolic age, because once the Bible was completed, uh, we didn't need these gifts anymore. We could, we could use this. This replaced all of these gifts. These were only temporary, and Paul says, in 1 Corinthians that these gifts were only temporary, okay? And so in Romans chapter eight, for example, Paul says the Spirit helps us put to death the deeds of the flesh, meaning he helps us overcome sin. Romans eight thirteen. not going to read all the passages, just to show you some of the things that the Spirit helps us with today. Also, he helps us who are flesh relate to our heavenly Father who is pure spirit. Think about that for a second. Somebody comes, well, someone we know a little bit, uh, uh, our uh, brother from Kenya, Jeffrey Karima, he comes here. He's from comp an, a complete other culture. He's from an African culture, right? And when you talk to him, he talks about how things go on in his country, but well, it's awfully different. He speaks English, but boy, you have to pay attention, right? You, you almost need somebody to translate for him because his accent is thick and, you know, and we're, we're having trouble, but he's a, he's a human being, he's a man, he's a Christian. You'd think we could really relate easily to each other and yet we have to really pay attention. Can you imagine how hard it is to relate to someone who is a pure spirit? <laughs> Not human, pure spirit. If we have trouble relating to human beings who have just a different language or a different culture than us, can you imagine how difficult it is to relate to a pure spirit who is God? So Paul says the spirit within us helps us to understand and relate to God, who is a pure spirit. He says he helps us to produce spiritual fruit. He helps us connect with God in prayer. And God will raise us from the dead, how? Through the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, Romans 8 verse 11. So is it important that the spirit be within you? Well, absolutely. I mean, for all these reasons, but especially for the last one I mentioned there. Paul says that it is through the power of the Spirit that dwells within us that God raises us from the dead. You know, the, 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 the argument that it's, uh, you know, baptism is not necessary for salvation, and of course, Paul's not talking about that here. It's out of context, but I mentioned this you know, in regards to these gifts. I mean, if, 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 if Acts 2.38 is accurate, that those who repent and are baptized, their sins will be forgiven and they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, what happens if you refuse to be baptized? Well, I guess you don't get those things. You don't get that because I don't see anywhere else in the Bible the moment when the Spirit you know, comes to you. So all of these teachings are very important, very basic, very important, and they all are linked together with all the other teachings, especially that Paul uh, has done. So the Holy Spirit has always done these things for Christians, whether in the first century or now, these things I'm mentioning here. It did additional things for certain individuals in the first century to help the church be established and organized and function. 
once the word was finally completed, then these gifts faded away and these other gifts that were there from the very beginning continue to this day. We all have all of these gifts and more. Now in addition to the spiritual help mentioned here in the first century, the Spirit, as I say, also provided certain ones in the church, teachers, preachers, saints, certain spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues, inspiration, spiritual knowledge and wisdom, to help them in establishing growing churches since they did not yet have the main tool necessary to do this work. And that was the complete New Testament revelation. So today the Spirit continues to bless us in the ways I listed from Romans 8, but no longer provides miraculous gifts. We no longer have the gift of inspiration and tongues and spiritual wisdom and knowledge directly given by God, because for almost 18 centuries we have had access to this. Okay. So what a few of them knew and taught from inspiration and spiritually guided wisdom then Everyone now can know and teach from God's word available to everyone. So my point with all of this is that Paul as an apostle had among other gifts, the spiritual gift of inspiration. What he wrote was inspired by God. He had one of those gifts. Well, he had several of them, but he had that one, that's for sure. Even Peter the apostle recognized that this gift uh, was possessed by Paul. Again, we'll jump out of the second Timothy and go this time to second Peter. Peter says, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found uh, by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him. Whoops, what, wisdom? Who? There's, there's that gift there, okay? And then he says, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. Do we see in this passage? Peter is equating what Paul is writing, given to him by the wisdom of God, to, he says, the rest of scriptures. Well, when Peter is saying the rest of scriptures, he's talking about the, what we call the Old Testament. So he's saying you know, what Paul is writing is sometimes hard to understand, and it is, right? When he talks about uh, who, the man of lawlessness in First and Second Timothy, you know, uh, Thessalonians, or when the end of the world is going to take place, when Jesus returns, it's kind of hard to understand some of that stuff, right? Or when he was caught up into the, the heavens. You know, there are things that are not quite that easy to understand. And Peter is saying, yes, we know. And he says, People in the church today are even trying to distort what he says as they do the other scriptures, as they do the Old Testament. So he's connecting the Old Testament inspired word of God to what Paul is writing at that time as inspired as well. This may explain more clearly Paul's encouragement to guard through the Holy Spirit the store of knowledge and teachings about the gospel that Timothy possessed. Paul knew that what he was writing was wisdom given to him by God, and he was trying to affirm in Timothy's mind, look, what I'm giving to you is not just my opinion. This is God's word, make sure you hang on to it and you treat it as such. We read verse 15 to 18, we jump back to our original, uh, excuse me, 11 and 12, 11 to 14, there we go. Okay, so he says, prescribe and teach these things what I've just explained to you here. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those um, who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So, Again, we're explaining here what Paul's encouragement to Timothy is all about. Here he's talking about the history, how he received this gift and how he should be using this gift and the historical moment when this was given to him. All right? In verse 15 to 18, he says, you are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes, 
the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. So Paul breaks his line of thought concerning various instructions you know, and encouragements by citing two examples. These, uh, here we go, these two, Phygelus and Hermogenes, Paul likely tried to encourage various leaders from the churches in Asia Minor, which that's where uh, Ephesus was, and Col the church at Colossae, that was in Asia Minor. Um, he probably tried to get people to come from there to come to his trial and testify on his behalf that he wasn't an instigator or a political, some kind of political rebel. But none from these churches agreed to plead on his behalf, including the two men he names who probably were at the church in Ephesus where Timothy was preaching. When Paul says all in Asia turned away, he doesn't mean the entire population, but rather all those that he asked to come testify on his behalf, they all refused. He didn't ask this of Timothy, since Timothy was his chief co-worker and acknowledging this at trial would put Timothy in danger. Oh wait, oh he's with you? He's, a, he's not just a member of your churches or someone who can speak for you? He's your assistant? Oh yeah, well yeah, sure, we'll put him on trial too. So he didn't want to put Timothy in danger. Uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes represent those who were unwilling to take a risk for their faith. And this episode exposed the weakness of their faith. Also a warning to Timothy about these guys. You watch these guys, they, they didn't have my back, they won't have your back either. And then uh, Onesiphorus, unlike the other two, this man was not ashamed of Paul's imprisonment. In other words, his imprisonment did not weaken or destroy this man's faith. On the contrary, it presented this faithful Christian man an opportunity for service in finding and ministering to Paul's physical and emotional needs. You know, Jesus said, I was in prison and you visited me, Matthew 25. So this is what this man did. It seems he also was from Ephesus and a faithful and well, as well as a fruitful member at that church. So Paul pronounces a blessing on this man that he received mercy from the Lord in the way that Onesiphorus showed mercy on Paul. And so Paul encourages Timothy to remain faithful to his calling as an evangelist, remain faithful to the gospel message, and remain faithful to the content and the manner of teaching given and modeled for him by Paul himself and Paul who had received all of this from God himself in an inspired manner. He then reminds Timothy of men who by their actions demonstrated clear examples of what faithfulness and unfaithfulness acted like in real time. This is what faithfulness looks like in real time and this is what unfaithfulness looks in real time. All right, so we'll stop there. That's, uh, I think we've got enough of that, uh, that, that particular passage. We managed to cover that. A Couple of lessons from this that kind of just really stand out. Number one, we as Christians have the same responsibilities today. Nothing's changed. We must also teach and preserve the integrity of the gospel message. You know that we're saved by grace, through faith, expressed in repentance and baptism. And that's the basic teaching of the gospel, as well as the rest of the teachings of the New Testament. Thankfully, we don't have to have them all in our minds. They're, they're recorded for us, they're preserved for us in any language, any dialect even. So we, we have a great advantage and we should be thankful to the men and, and women, the people in the past who have, you know, who have guarded this and passed it along, many of whom have been killed for their work. You know, the early translators of the Bible into common language were, were <laughs> they were martyred as if that was like a bad thing to do, to, to you know, give access to the people, God's word. So we, we're standing on the shoulders you know, of many great people uh, in the past. Our task, of course, to prepare the next generation to do this for the following generation who will continue for the, uh, for the next until uh, Jesus returns. You know, don't, don't under, undervalue uh, our Sunday school, Wednesday night, you know, those children that we're teaching. Oh, 
Boy, so important. So, so important. The people that work in that, you know, quiet, quietly you know, labor for years and years in, the, in these areas. And sometimes you don't think, you don't think you're doing anything. You know, that little rascal in the corner there, never paying attention, jumping up and down in his seat like he's got ants in his pants. You know, uh, you know, crazy teenager in the, in the youth group. And all of a sudden, that's the guy that wants to be a missionary. <laughs> And you ask him why, and he says, I don't know, there's just something, you know, I don't know. I love the church. Why? Well, he loves the people who taught him in church. From an early age, from an early age, he, she, you know, has been taught God's word. And so many of you in this room are, are part of that. You know. Very, very important. We're not responsible for the body of Christ throughout the world. But we are responsible for the Choctaw area. That's our responsibility. This generation is directly responsible for the next generation. Whether or not this congregation is faithful in God's word and deed in the year 2040 is being decided and worked out now by us as we prepare the next generation of Christians to lead and preserve this congregation's faithfulness and service. I don't know if you know, but in September of this year, uh, 2019, uh, this uh, church will be celebrating 80 years. 80 years this congregation has stood well in, you know, in town, but you know, has been formed, 80 years. 80 years, no, no split. I mean, if you, if you were to take a record of, of all the congregations, that's, that's quite, a, quite a task. And uh, you know, I say, I give, a credit to uh, the, uh, those who serve as elders in this congregation for the many, many years that it's been here. No split, this church is united, moving forward, it's a marvelous thing. Lesson number two, God will test us. The only way we can determine if our faith is weak or strong is through testing. We never know when or how, but we can be sure that it will happen. Just like the test of the men named by Paul in verse 15 and 16. Will you, come and, will you come and stand for me at my trial? Uh, well, I, wait, I, that's harvest season. I don't know, you know I, I, gotta, I think I got a business trip. I don't know if I can do that. You know? Will you stand and serve as a deacon or would you serve as an elder? Well, you know, awfully busy at work. You know. Same thing. A test is a test. God comes to us and says, you ready to step up? And a lot of times we say, well, you know, no, I don't think so. He's not going to throw us away. He, he, he won't send us to hell because of that. He is so good that he'll, he'll wait us out. He'll wait for us a couple of more years or whatever and say, you ready now? Would you like to, could you step up now? The key to passing the test is to realize that our faith is being examined. When a crisis or challenges, a challenge appears, it's not really about health or money, it's not really about justice or fairness, it's not really about success or failure. When Christians face crisis or challenge, it's always about faith, always. Is it weak or strong? Is it ignorant or enlightened? We pass the test of faith when we go to God for help or understanding or strength or strategy or just plain old endurance. I'm not winning this battle, Lord, the only thing I can ask you now is just help me stay in the game. Just help me stay in the game, that's all. Because I, I, I'm not even considering victory at this point. I just want to stay in the game. The questions embedded in the crisis or the trial or the challenge, the question is always, do you still believe? Do you still trust me? And the right answer is always, here I am, Lord, use me, teach me, refine me, prepare me. Every time, that's the answer, that's the right answer every time. Okay, so there's uh, 2 Timothy, verses six to 18, some commentary on that. We'll continue with this. And I remind you, when we finish 2 Timothy, we'll do Titus right after that, and that way we'll have completed a study of the pastoral epistles. All right, thank you very much for your attention.